everybody. It's Warren Hewitt. I'm sitting here with the rather wonderful Richard Furch. How are you, my friend? How's it going, Warren? I'm How's good. We're at the Mix House. Cool. That's H A U S. That's right. You've got to spell it right, you know. Oh, got to go there. Definitely. How long have you had this place? Um, this is Mix House Two, one would say. So two point oh. Yeah. Oh no, it's is it two point two point one? Um. Well, it is. You know why I'm going to ask? Because of the tree. The oh, uh... uh, the tree. Well, I, uh, yeah, we'll talk about the tree in a moment. <laughs> I think my my place was called Mix House since about 2008, but I had this place for about seven years now. So that, maybe this is the first fully formed Mix House, and the other ones were Mix Shacks. Mix Shacks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, but it's a it's a beautiful place in Encino. Uh, we are in Los Angeles, of course, because Warren lives here. And, yes. do, and I do, of course. And um, no, this is a place to make records. Yeah, we're enjoying a day where it's probably, I don't know, 80 or really outside. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, and then uh, can't hear anything in here. There's like two feet walls. So it's a place to be away from the world and, you know, make your music. Wonderful. Yeah. So when did you, well, first of all, you were born in Germany. Yep. Whereabouts? Uh, I'm, I was born in Hamlin. And you, if you know the Pied Piper of stories, that's where that was. But actually, I uh, I grew up in Berlin, like you know, Beautiful. where art is, where uh, where my my ex, uh, exposure to all kinds of German music started. And then um, about you know, I don't know, twenty twenty one years in, I was like you know, maybe move across the pond, uh, study at Berkeley. Uh, I'm a pianist myself. Uh, Great. Wanted to be a jazz pianist at one point, but you know, once you know, once you hear Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea play, you go like. You do that, and I'll I'll go record you instead. <laughs> no, I was I was I was decent. I was decent, so I can hold my own. But making records is a better use of my talents in this case. So you went to Berkeley. Did you do recording studies there as well as? Yeah, actually, while I was practicing piano, trying to be the guy, mm -hmm. I actually started at the SAE in Berlin. Shout out. Oh, wow. And I got a, actually an audio engineering, I guess they called it a diploma at the time. Got my feet wet and then decided, you know, at Berkeley, let's continue the music study. Everybody at Berkeley has to be a four year music major. So you, can, you just can't, uh, you cannot not be a musician when you're there. Um, and, uh, and then my, my major became music production and engineering. And so the two together, the SAE and the Berkeley, and Berkeley together gave me my education. So yes, I accidentally did it twice. <laughs> no, that sounds, that sounds like a, a rather happy accident. It was, it was good. I, I, I'm just thankful because actually the SAE, uh, because of the, the, the transfer credit system in the US, they took some of the SAE things that I learned, made it a little cheaper for Berkeley. Great. Bada bing, bada boom. Everybody happy. Yeah, I like that. You know, so, um, and then graduating from there, going to New York, uh, going to Sound on Sound Studios, um, David Amlin's place at the time. Um, big, you know, four room facility. At, when I came there, they had a J Series SSL, Neve VR, Neve Capricorn. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, yeah. One of the early digitals. Uh, yeah, good. I, I always liked that console. Um, it was a hard sell because, you know, if you're, if you're a freelance engineer and you don't know that board, that's, that's going to be a tough session. I've tried. Working on a couple which I didn't know, and yes, they are. Yes, <laughs> they are. They're interesting, but uh, but they. But if you know it, of course. Uh, yeah, and you know, and actually, they gave me my start in a way because, well, I was the guy who learned that thing. So the engineer who would come in that I could assist for, say, hey, that guy really knows the board and can save my ass. So all of a sudden, you get gigs through that. Uh, so it's it's a positive too. And then over time, that board went and became a Sony Oxford, speaking of another digital mm -hmm. console. And the VR went and became an SSLJ as well because we're in New York, we're making jazz and jingles and Broadway recordings during the day and hip hop uh, at night. We're right next to Daddy's house, uh, who at the time was uh, Puff Daddy still, then he was Diddy and then, well, you, you, keep, up, you keep up with that. So the, the hip hop clientele for the night sessions, they demanded the JCs. There was a better sale uh, for them. Um, so we had everybody in uh, Swiss Beats, uh, Terror Squad, Wyclef Jean, the, these kind of hip hop greats of the 2000 to 2005s. You know, Jay Z, 
That was great. Outcast. A bunch of a bunch of these things. So a great, great kind of mixture between you know you learn popular music from the hip hop side, and you uh, record uh, you learn recording sciences from recording jingles. And I saw the Broadway. speaker box. Uh, oh yeah, platinum record yeah. out there. That was that was a fun one. Andrea three thousand. We worked on a couple of tracks. One was uh, "She Lives in My Lap," and the other one I never quite know which one it was because it it I'm, I think it changed it changed titles and just don't know anymore. Yeah. Um, and uh, Rosario Dawson was there. Really, um, if you ever get to be in session with Rosario Dawson, you tell yourself you you're you're a lucky man. That's a very beautiful and kind person. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, no, she was beautiful. And then then uh, Andre as well. He was very. Uh, he was very great. I mean, that was, it was a blessed time. Dead Prez, uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you enjoy that, uh, hip hop on loud records. Um, it was beautiful. So, but then after a while, you know, the 24, like you started as an assistant, you have 100 hour weeks, which is great because you make money, which is not great because, well, there goes your social life or all, or all yeah. of it. Um, <laughs> and after I for it four years, I decided, you know, this is great. But I think I'm I'm looking for a different kind of music. Actually, I came out to the West Coast. A gig told me, um, a gig took me here. I was looking for more, you know, rock, acoustic, organic, rock pop. The, like who was big at the time? Um, John Shanks, that mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Yeah, rock pop. Mm -hmm. that, I would have looked for that, and I kind of totally failed in that <laughs> endeavor. <laughs> <laughs> like it was certainly here, but. Um, those gigs were taken by the people who already had them. Actually, one of my very good friends, Jeff Rothschild, uh, was uh, John Shanks' engineer for like 12 years or something mm -hmm. like doing that exact kind of work, you know. Um, which is fine. You go to another coast, things happen, and before you know, your credits uh, kind of like catch up with you and um, make more R&B records, uh, R&B pop records in that way. So how did you get to work with Prince? Interesting story. Uh, I want to go like two steps back from that because I actually before before I worked with Prince, I worked with Terry, uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis quite a bit. Fantastic. And um, uh, obviously they were used to be in the time together. Basically they were employed by by uh, by Prince because uh, Prince put time together at the time. And so I got a call from actually Berkeley, and, and this is maybe something where I say, well, you know, this is one of the things why. Uh, why school is great. Like literally seven years out of school, the guy who um, was Jimmy Jam and, T and Terry Lewis's engineer called back his school and, and our school, says, I need a guy. I need a guy to, to help me. We have a sh deadline. We need, we need somebody who's in R&B, who's great, whatever. His name was Matt Marin, uh, is Matt Marin, a great, great engineer. Um, and all of a sudden, I get a call from my old school seven years after I graduated. There is an opportunity, and this might be for you. Uh, did an interview, and nothing happened, <laughs> which was kind of weird, but that's how this works. But like a, a year later, there's like, OK, we're, we're, we're finish, finishing a Shaka Khan album. We have three days to mix 12 songs. So we need three engineers. And that was me, Matt Marin, and another guy called Wojtek. And so we did that, and I uh, struck up a relationship with them and uh, became one of their engineers over time, which we did Did a lot. you all do four songs each? I think so. I, I remember doing four, so I, I guess so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe some were already done, I don't remember. But that was the deadline, like start Friday, deliver Monday. So that, so that, that, that was a great experience when we moved on to Patti LaBelle and uh, Ruben Studdard and what else? Uh, uh, the Isley Brothers. Like, records like that, and then Usher, of course, because... Uh, um, uh, Terry Lewis and Jimmy Jam, they always work with the top line, you know, um, R&B slash R&B pop artists. So it was great, but here's the funny part, and this is why I wanted to actually say this. Now, one would maybe think that you meet somebody like Prince because you worked with somebody like Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, but that was totally not the case. Like, the, the connection was entirely separate. Entirely separate. So basically, I'm at. Um, I, I like this story. It's. Uh, I'm at Chalice. We're doing some records for Christina Milian, who's like. A, I remember. Yeah, I, yeah, Christina. Yeah, I worked with her years ago. Yeah. Uh, she, she's a sweetheart. A sweetheart. Great yeah. singer. Great dancer. Really, yeah. really nice person. Um, so we sit there. We're like, I don't know, three, four songs in. Um, actually, uh, Makiba Riddick was in there too, vocal producing, and the producer called Matt, Sci Matt Scientist was doing the tracks. And, um, you know, 
she says, well, tonight Prince might show up like at three o'clock or something like that. And I'm, I'm sitting there going like, yeah, sure, that, like that's going to happen, right? But, you know, we're still working, we're still working. All of a sudden, like the security guy walks in, like checks out the studio. And then a moment later, Prince walks in. And he's like, hey. And he's actually, you know, the reason why he's there is because he and Christina are personal friends. So um, he wanted to check out what they're doing. We're at one of the biggest studios in town. It's a beautiful place. So he just wanted to visit. He uh, uh, was very jovial and like wanted to check out uh, what was going on. He was hanging like almost like he was a guest, like not in the way where he walks in and goes like, well, I'm Prince, so we're here now. No, he was a guest. He was very cordial. It was awesome. And he's like, you know, what are you working on? Play it, play it for me. And of course, everybody in the room it's like, um, okay, you know what we're going to do. So <laughs> but we were working on a song called uh, Would Become Her Single at the time, Us Against the World. And um, so, well, we'll, uh, we'll just start playing it. Uh, I remember this because I was like, I don't know how loud you, how loud you listen to Prince. So mm -hmm. I'm like gesturing at him so like this. And he's like, so we, right. we turn it up. Uh, this is Chalice A, like Oxburgers, good stuff, you know. Sure. So the whole song goes by. It's a beautiful song, well, uh, well written, well uh, produced. Uh, but we just had, a, had done it that day, I think, or maybe the day before. Um, and he's like, the first thing he said when it was over, he's like, so who mixed that? And I'm like, well, that would be me, you know? Um, and he's like, well, then I need your number. And I'm <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, this is a few years in, you know? I've, like, mm -hmm. I've done this for like eight, nine years now. This is the way you think it would happen like somebody hears someone that you really uh, that they like and they would call you right instead of the sing around uh, the go around like oh the label and the person and the manager and the friend and the whatever and the no this was just as natural as it got like he's like yeah I'll right but you'd worked your butt off to get into that room of course no no i mean i'm not saying it was undeserving but it is no. the thing that you think the way it works and you haven't but you don't experience it that often you know and to uh, to have it happen with prince was amazing of course i'm like that's one of those days when you don't have a business card on you so you like scribble your yeah, number on a piece crossed. of papers and go like i guess here's my number I, I think my i'm so embarrassed right now like just because i can't I don't have a card even, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, and so he walks out, uh, everything was funny, ha happy. And so I go home to my wife and it's like, hey, guess what happened? I met, met Prince yesterday. And, and people uh, should know that I'm a super fan. Like I probably have four, uh, like every single one of her, his albums, his bootlegs, mm -hmm. um, whatever you want, I probably have it. And so, so this was actually bigger for me than just a very famous person. Uh, yep. Personally, that would be if, if Queen walked in or sure. Brian, Brian May walked in. Now I'd lose it. That, yeah. yeah, and I'm, I'm not saying starstruck because we're both no. we know how to deal with that, but definitely like this is a special moment. Um, so I tell my wife that happened, but you know nothing's going to come from that. And sure enough, two weeks later, his his manager calls. Or I don't even know if he calls or texts. Don't remember. He's like, "Do you want to come down tonight and uh, talk to him?" And I'm like, "Yep." So basically, that, that was a Saturday. We talk. He's he's like uh, he tells me what he what he's looking to do, um, and I'm like, yeah, that all sounds very reasonable and sounds like a thing to do, you know. And he's like, okay, can we do it tomorrow? I'm like, yeah. Uh, what do you mean? Yeah. So I need you to build a studio on a Sunday with 24 Neve and API preamps in my house. And I'm like, okay, cool. I want is this it. in LA? Yeah, this is in LA at this point. Yeah. Because obviously he has Paisley Park and we, we went there later. Uh, but for this particular start of this record, uh, the, the record is called Lotus Flower, came out in 2009. That was what's supposed to happen. I'm like, of course, first of all, I say yes. Then I'm, then I'm going like, where do I get all this gear from on a Sunday? And sure enough, calling around uh, rental companies, nobody wanted to do it except for, and this is why he gets a shout out, Platinum Rentals. Brian McCurry hooked it up. Like he's like, I got you. I, I can do it. I'll deliver. It. We'll, we'll build a studio. We tracked within two or three hours after that. Did like ten songs, uh, basic sessions, and then uh, went on a wild ride for about a year, I would say. You know. So uh, in in all my travels, this was probably the one thing I was shooting for always, and the one time it actually happened the most natural that you can imagine. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a magic time. Fantastic. Yeah.
So a year. Yeah, a year it took it took about. I mean, you know, to do the bulk of the record. This is a double album, so there was another uh, another part to, of it where we were in Paisley Park and did all the cool stuff like recording the original Lin drum machine that they he did uh, uh, when drafts cry um, with. So so basically like you know nonstop Prince land and you basically you drop everything else. You drop all your clients for a moment. Like guys, I'm I'm busy. This call comes every mo every night at like 7 p.m. Be here, be there, be whatever, and I got to do this for now, you know. So did you relocate with your wife to Minnesota when you were at Paisley Park? Oh, or? no. I mean, no, we were here, and then we would be, um, um, he, he was here in the in the Beverly Hills. We would fly out there for stints of like two weeks or so, something like that, and I, I was over, out there probably five or six times, but over time, probably the length of three months or something like that. And was it to do like drum tracking? What, what did he love about his own studio? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I mean, apart from the fact that he probably had a bunch of business dealings that obviously I'm not privy to, sure. that he had to be in Minnesota for, th th there's a real working feeling in that complex that you can do, for instance, video editing in one room while me, the engineer, gets some stuff done in, in one of the studios while the graphic designer sits on the next floor and does the, uh, the posters or even you know no, new um, new costume designs, etc. So it was it was definitely like that was probably the most efficient way to be there. Plus, you know that's where he lives. Goes at night to uh, goes goes out to a concert, visits his old band ma mates who play there, you know uh, like Michael Bland and Sonny T. Um, I, I I always got the feeling that that's where he was at home. You know, after after he passed, the city of Min, uh, Minneapolis actually gave him not gave him but but bestowed Prince Day on him. This was like in two thousand, just after he passed, like in September or so, uh, two thousand sixteen. They made like a declaration, let it be known, this is Prince Day now, whatever, and um, and he, they pointed out, you know, in all of his travels, in all of his fame, he never left them. Mm -hmm. Yes, he stayed other places, but he never moved to LA, never moved to London. He just like stayed there for an extended amount of time, but always came back. So that that's what I felt. I, mostly, that's what I felt about, about it. like that. He liked making music there. He could control it. I mean, this, he's an he was an engineer in the way that he recorded himself, not necessarily in the way that he knows every single piece, but he could hold his own, of course. So, and that's the way it was set up for him. What kind of hours did you work with him? Well, that, that's interesting that you asked this because, you know, first of all, when I was still in New York doing the hip hop session, I was prepared for anything. Let's go all night. Uh, remember, a little Kim session was 72 hours long and you just stayed and then hoped that you can grab a shower at the studio in between. But so I was ready. I was like, obviously, I knew all the stories. It's like, OK, this is going to be probably hardcore every day. And it was not. It was not. It was like, you know, it started at 7. It, it went 7 p.m. PM. It went all night. Like I said, it would go till 7 or 10. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to assume that he maybe got up a few hours before that because we're doing rock star hours now. That's, that's what he called it, uh, too. He's like, you know, I can't do work during the day. That's not rock star. Um, but, it would, you know, it would be very nice, like, have a sit down dinner for a moment and you know, go to the studio, work until like 7 or 10 in the morning, but that's only 12, 10 to 15 hours. It's not the end of the world, you know. Sure. And I guess the, the only... The Would you all eat dinner together before the session? No, I mean, not always, but often enough. He had like a cook there who would uh, who do put something together and we would do that. And then we would do... Would you talk about what you're about to record or...? No. No? Okay. No, he was very much like, okay, so... And so now we basically we we finish the food. Let's now go record, uh, and I have to be ready like you do when you're an engineer, of course. And he would just uh, bring in two to four songs, and we would do them top to bottom in, in that night. But part of the process was kind of you know follow along, keep the session happening while not being told exactly what's going to happen, which is in my case or in my experience of all of the artists I worked with, a very common approach. Absolutely, you know. There's no lyric sheets. There's no lead sheets. Things just happen, and you make it make it work for everybody. Um, yeah, and sometimes he would, we would, I would go home. It would be like eight a.m. or something like that. And home being a hotel there, which is, was kind of in walking distance, 
Um, and, you know, and two hours later, he might call and say, you know, there's this one thing. Can you come back to just do this? And then it might turn into a few hours. But like overall, a reasonable amount of time against the other experiences I had in my life. Like, yeah, that's sure. what I would say. Uh, five days a week, seven days a week? When you're there, seven days a week. Sure. I mean, you know, like we go there for 14, uh, 14 days. We work the whole time and then go back, won't hear anything for a couple of days, and we're, we're continuing, you know. But that's the mind of the artist. That's that's the way this works. Uh, we were very efficient, though. Like I said, like it could be two or four songs a night. Of course, not every single thing was released, you know. Um, and uh, they were fully fledged, and he played everything. Um, and this man is, we know he's a musical genius, but I also, I've never heard him play a wrong note even. Like they, they might not even, in very, very many cases, they were not like a second take. It was just like, okay, so now I'm gonna play some uh, keyboard and we'll punch it in and say, like, okay, cool. Now let me play some guitars and that's it. And uh, everything just flew like from the mind into the tape deck. Were you starting a lot of the time with live drums? Was he playing live drums? Both, Both. yeah. It was all set up, you know, and sometimes he would have his band there and they would jam and we recorded it all, or he would, um, uh, he would, there's a, at least one record, uh, it's called Chocolate Box, like one single at the time with uh, featuring Q-Tip, uh, where he basically did the Lynn drum and then played drums on top of it. So all your normal production techniques that you know of, Definitely, just with one player. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was a time. It was it was quite a time. And then the record came out. It went to number two Billboard, and obviously number one all genre charts because well they're waiting for it. It was I think it was uh, if I I'm, I think I'm not mistaken if that that was the last gold selling record he did. He did it uh, through Target. Uh, made a special uh, release. Uh, in the end, it became a triple album because he put one of his prodigies on there too. Hmm. So like he, he released it at a, at a decent price and sold, I think it sold 700,000, six, six or 700,000 copies total. Just a nice place to be. Fantastic. Yeah. What do you feel like um, after that? I, I, I wonder, because we work a lot with different artists of right. different talent levels, of different, you know, whether it be songwriting or singing or musicianship. Um, what do you think the biggest takeaway that you got from that experience that you could apply to working with other artists? That's a good point. That's a good question. I, I would say the most important part is to know, maybe as a producer, as yourself, and a mixer, um, as yourself, um, the most important thing is this, this reassurance that you can hang with any level of person. Mm. Like at that time to have been wor uh, working with uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis who are literally the most successful producers of all time in the history of record music and Prince and being able to go like, yeah, not only are these friends for now, you know, I mean work friends of course, uh, but uh, you, you, you hang with them, you feel like, you feel I learned a self-confidence about myself. I say, well, whatever walks in the in the room here, I can I can hang with that. I can deliver my best. And that doesn't mean that you never that is not never a good fit. That happens. That's it's just business. But it's not because um, you can't handle the situation. It's mm -hmm. because of artistic disagreement. It's because of you know we have other plans. I get it. That's cool. But I think that's what it is. It's an important thing because somebody who just comes up wonders on a daily basis, am I good enough? And we mm. still do, of course. I'm not saying course. that falls away. But I'm saying, but you've proven yourself. I heard this once, um, Anita Baker said that to about herself. I think she, she went through um, maybe a writer's block or something for uh, quite some times in the 90s. And then basically looked at the Grammy that she won for, oh my, Sweet Love, maybe, uh, one of her hits. Uh, and she's basically like, you know, I can do this. I did a best song Grammy. I can, I am a good songwriter, and sometimes you need that. And but but there is a start from from you know your humble beginnings to that point when you did something that you arguably think this was good and people liked it, and the person who hired me liked it. We're doing pretty okay here. That it's important for you in in your in your career. One thing I'm thinking of is when I was coming up, I worked with a lot of up and coming artists that needed a lot of help yeah 
And I thought that was kind of a, that was not kind of, that was definitely a blessing because when I did end up being in a room with guys of, you know, this sort of much higher ta talent level, it was a lot easier. Yep. Because I knew how to instinctively fix one little tiny mistake as a, because I'm so used to fixing 10,000. That's right. And um, so I feel it's kind of a blessing to work with not very good drummers, not very good singers. You know, the, these, are, these are things I don't shy away from. Yeah. You know, because I realized I, that's where I learned my chops. And then you get in a room with a guy, obviously, like I, you did. I, would like, I like what you say, because basically, to me, the definition of a pro mm -hmm. is, the, the, sorry, the, the definition of your prof uh, professionality, like how high your professionality is, is what answers do you have to an unfortunate situation? Mm. What can I still fix? And by fixing, I don't not just mean mixing or editing, I mean like coaching, I mean like uh, how can I get out of this person what I need to get out of him or her to make this record. Where, where your answers stop, that's the height of your professionality. Sure. That's, that's the things you can fix, the things you can get from A to B. And I think it's, it's important. We don't have the, all the answers. At one point there, there is a place where we go like, yeah, I got nothing on this one. And that's kind of where, where, you, where your powers end. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, but it's, it's it's beautiful. I mean, as you know, you hire a full band, uh, one of the Nashville Cats, or 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 someone here. You have somebody like Tim Pierce, or and uh, who who can I come up with? Jamie Muhabarak, um, Vinny Caliuda, or mm -hmm. uh, or you know, you, you hire these people, and they do half the job for you. Mm -hmm. You know, you sure you you tell them what you want and etc. But these guys just perform, and actually, at the time, even when they disagree. At one point, they will just say, but I'll do it for you because you're the guy who hired me. Mm -hmm. And they will lay it down and you will get what you want. And that's a beautiful, beautiful feeling too. A great place to make records. But of course, that's not every day. And of course, that doesn't mean every record has to be like that. And some just have to be a little bit more complicated and circuitous to become a special piece of history. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I do agree. I agree. Um, as a part of part of your story and, and things we're talking about, like talking about creating all those opportunities that like you did all of that work and all of that travel and that risk of flying halfway across the world to get into a place where you've done it, already done years of work to be in a room working with an artist in Christian Milano, Milano. I worked with her many years ago. Very talented. I don't think ever got as successful as a talent level. Which was quite surprising. Yeah, but yeah. She, had, she did her own thing. She well, she was like, also an actress as well, wasn't she? Yeah, and she well. did, the, I think she did that whole The Voice uh, correspondence thing. Mm. She's a very, I think as a media person, she is very sure. convincing, and I, I wish nothing but the best for her. Absolutely. Yeah. So you've done all this wonderful work to get in that situation, also working in Chalice, which is a, an incredible studio. That's what provided you with the opportunity of Prince coming in, because if you think about it this way, the artist trusted that it was okay to bring somebody like that into a room yeah. to meet you. Yeah. Not necessarily to introduce you. What I mean is like, I have been in many, many situations where I maybe got a rock star that wants to know this, that or the other. And I'm like, I'm not bringing them here. This is a mess. Yeah. These guys have no idea what they're doing and they're just going to freak out and fawn all over him. You know, it's a, it's a good, it's a good part of the conversation because I feel like to, uh, another thing we can talk about is, um, obviously creating your own luck, creating your opportunities, but also having a temperament to be able to work with artists of a certain stature, that's a, bit, that's a big deal, you know, that they feel comfortable around you. Yeah. Do you feel that was something that you were you're always conscious of or do you think it was just something in who you are? Let's put it like this. I, I always knew that was part of the gig and when I say part, I'm, I don't think it's 5%, I think it's probably 40%. I mean. Mm -hmm. Like many people say, you know, you have to be a good hang. And that doesn't mean you have to go drinking with them. It just means sure. uh, because that might be actually the exact wrong idea. I agree. Um, but it means, you know, they want to be happy to see you. They want to spend the next 10 hours with you. They want to understand that you understand where they're coming from. So if you, if, you're, uh, if you are a Queen fan and you get to work with Queen to never have heard their prior work is kind of silly. You know, so like be the person who actually is on their side. Mm -hmm. um, and before you know, before you know, and obviously doing a decent job, uh, 
they trust you in in many other ways. <laughs> there was a time when I had to take one of Prince's really, really, really expensive cars and t take his uh, t uh, put gas in it. And here's the funny part. Now, somebody would say, that's not my job. This is not what I do. But I realized this is not about the car and this is not about the gas. This is about the trust of this mm -hmm. person saying, you're part of the, the operation now and we can do this. And this was very at the very beginning where you would say, it was in a way a test. I, I, I don't know how much he thought about it, but it was that. But at the same time, it was part of, we're embracing you. We're about to embark on something bigger. Mm -hmm. And we are people, you know, like this, I can sell sound. I can sell my knowledge of getting a record done. But in the grand uh, in the grand scheme, none of this matters. Like in the end, the hang and the product matters. But most people they don't look at you all day long. We're like, okay, so the fader up, the fader down. What EQ are you using? That's fans. That's people like you and I. But that's not the people who you're making the record with. They're just sure. wanting to say, I have an idea, an artistic idea. Um, I say this very many times. I don't know if I'm fully right, but you tell me. Um, an artist, a rock, let, let's say a rock star, that could be an R&B person, but a person who wants to be a rock star, which is a person who stands on stage, has adoring fans, hopefully has a message and actually likes what they're doing, of course. I think their primary goal is to stay being that person. Our job is mm -hmm. to help them stay being that person. Mm -hmm. So even if they care about our Neef Priest and all that stuff for a little bit, the most important thing is what they will never tell you is like, can you help me staying, stay being that person and be on that stage tomorrow and have the adoring fans and get me an opportunity to write one more song that they love? Sure. And that's, that's my job. That's trying to be part every, of that. Every older legacy artist I, want, I work with all want current hit singles. Yeah. It doesn't matter if they've had 20 top 10 singles in their life and they could be 65 years old, they still want another one. Yeah, They're not content to rest on their laurels, not the great ones, not the ones with, the, with, with a huge career. Yeah, they would ju They'd be just as happy to have another top 10 single now. Yeah, and it's your job. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they're basically, once you have the gig, it is your job to just keep it. You know, like it, they trust you from the beginning. They trust you from your credits or somebody says, hey, that guy's really great. That's how you get it anyway. Um, so it's your task to not lose it. Does that happen from time to time? Sure. But that's, now, that's, that's the point. When you're sitting in Germany and you're a kid, and I know you, you talked about, you know, obviously at one stage you wanted to be a jazz piano player, but when it started to realize that you could be an engineer, a mixer, a producer on that side, um, you were always, I'm putting words into your mouth, you can tell me I'm wrong, but you always wanted the best. You always wanted, you, Prince was an idea. I want to be in a room with Prince. You weren't going, well, you know, I'd like to be like a middle class, make a hundred grand a year, professional engineer. Was it always, no, I want to work with the best of the best? That's interesting. I actually didn't quite think of it as the best of the best, but I was thinking of, I, have, uh, I was a huge Prince fan, but also Michael Jackson, Queen, yes. Nirvana, which is obviously something totally different, but mm -hmm. you know, uh, we're we're exposed to it in in, sure. in Europe. But also a bunch of hip hop. So it's not that I fell into hip hop. So I love Cypress Hill, Gangstar, uh, Gurus, Jazz Mataz, uh, Well, all the stuff that DJ, oh, yeah, Jazz Mataz. Yeah, yeah, all the stuff that DJ Premier did. Um, but then also, uh, I think it's a British thing, the Us Three stuff mm -hmm. that uh, where they raided the Blue Note jo uh, uh, sure. stuff. Uh, but then also uh, uh, Dr. Dre and stuff like so. I was I was influenced. In Europe, those DJ Shadow was huge. Remember that? DJ Shadow. That was so good that. Record. Yeah, and uh, that, that, that's yeah. No, that's uh, and also DJ Crush mm -hmm. with Ronnie Jordan, uh, yep. and then later like a bunch. I can't of, believe Ronnie died so young. Yeah, I, I just actually heard that uh, like about a year or two ago. Like yep. I asked a friend who knew him, what's, what's up with him? He's like, oh, he's actually passed away. I did not he's know. Like late forties, mid late forties. Some, I mean, great, great guitar player, and he had, had something. He really tapped into something mm -hmm. with with the, like. Well, I think at the time it was called acid jazz. Acid jazz, yeah. right? You know, I, I mean, to me it was always kind of like hip hop with some jazz. You know? Yeah, I used to play in a, a band called The Collective in in oh, okay. uh, in, uh, in England and. Uh, 
it was fun. We used to have all these players come through, amazing players. And I'd just sit there, jig 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 you know. Yeah, but then <laughs> you ca then came sort of like, like na late 90s, 95 to like 2000, you had all uh, Jungle mm -hmm. and Garage. Uh, like I was a huge uh, Ronnie Size fan. Sure. Uh, LTJ Bookham. Uh, who else? Uh, well, I think what was unique about that scene was the, the musicality that was coming yeah. into it. Because you had these... Tricky. Tricky. Oh, Tricky was amazing. Massive Attack. Massive oh, Attack, okay, thank yeah. you. That's, of course, uh, uh, Boy Morang. Uh, they, uh, a few a few of these Portis people. Portis Head, 93. Yeah. Yeah. Portis Head, yeah. Brand I, New Heavies. Brand New Heavies, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, you're bringing up a lot of things that I was actually listening to at the time. And... Um, it was great musicianship, great songs. Sotek. Yeah. 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 Um, I, so going back to your question, was it that I always wanted to the best? No, but I realized that in Germany, little music, came, sorry, little music came out of Germany that I was actually a fan of. I mean, mm -hmm. sure, there were the German locals. There's a guy called Herbert Gernemeyer. who's a huge there. Like, he's like, I mean, I'm probably gonna butcher this, but he's probably the Jimmy Buffett of Germany. <laughs> but, but, I mean, like, like a singer-songwriter kind sure. of person. But he's he's uh, been around for forty years, uh, or the uh, Johnny Alliday of Johnny Alliday. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, yeah. like that that kind of the person. Cliff Richard. Oh, Cliff Richard. Cliff wow. Richard's the English sort of British. Cliff Richard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, kind of. Um, yeah. Or Christy Burke or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, now now we're going all the way down the rabbit hole. But uh, <laughs> basically, these are uh, I realize you know everybody who makes music that I actually liked mm -hmm. was not in Germany or the music that was close to that was actually kind of copies of the music I liked. So moving, moving to America was, I, I, I think it's still dreaming and aiming high. I think that's what I'm trying to ascertain. Yeah, I mean, what, I feel what, like if you're, gonna, if you're going to get a career like you have, you have to go for it. You can't be like, oh, I'm just going to, yeah. I mean, I was, I was more naive. I, I mean, I never thought of like, okay, I'm not going to make a living off this. Like, mm -hmm. that, not, not that that was not a danger, but the fact that if you're 18 and you're into music, that's not what you concern yourself with because that's what that would be basically listening to your parents, right? Mm -hmm. So um, sure, that will be part of the problem down mm -hmm. the line. But when you start, you go like, ah, screw it, this is this is gonna work out somehow. You know, with my father also going like, so what are you gonna do? You know, um, and being very supportive, not not the whole time, but at the right time, at being right hold, time, yeah. uh, supportive. It happened that way. But when. When the decision was made, because I actually thought about going to Great Britain, uh, LIPA, uh, Liverpool Institute of Performing Arts. Mm -hmm. um, but the decision was made to go, go to Berkeley and it was, it felt natural. It didn't even feel that much of a jump. It felt more of a like, I hope they take me. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens. There was not even a plan to stay necessarily. Right. It was more like while you're at Berkeley and you're like, so I'm about to graduate, which was really fast. Like I did it in five semesters, but in only 18 months because they have faster semesters. Uh, so they, you can take three semesters per year. And all of a sudden the question comes up, and now do I go home? <laughs> like that was probably one of the more pivotal moments of my career. And now you know what I, what I really should do is uh, having no other consideration than this. Once in my life, I should l uh, live in New York, and so I did. Um, <laughs> I can't say that was a grand master plan, except for, well, I did that by moving there with a van, and now I lived in New York, and let's and it kind of worked out. So mm -hmm. if you go back and go like, well, Richard Furcher's a mastermind because he, he planned his whole career, and it all this, no, <laughs> no I, <laughs> like I, I, things steps cuddled together in a way where I don't I'm think like, you're, I don't think you're saying that what I, what I think is is you're saying at least what I'm hearing is that you just worked really hard and then got yourself into position to, to take great opportunities and, not, so, uh, and yeah. not mess them up well I mean I've messed up some opportunities too like oh, we, we all have, have. Uh, so, you know. some without our doing and some with, because there's forces at hand that we just can't control and that's, that's it's just the way this works sure. well we're in the, we're in the music industry which is incredibly competitive it is and a good friend of mine called it it is brutal yeah <laughs> it, is brutal. It, it is it's the truth and it's uh, we, it's not like we didn't know that we actually the funny part is our our parents tried to warn us even though they had no idea how bad it is yeah. and now um but they were right and then some mm -hmm. um uh, that's all that's all good though um you're right though though the one thing maybe the one thing i'm most proud of is the fact that i did go to places and when I were, was in those places, like 
first at the SAE or in Berlin, for, then at Berkeley, then at New York, then actually throwing everything away, just moving to LA in, within like a week or two. Whenever I did that, I went 100% to the dismay of my wife, now, uh, now wife, then girlfriend, like, I, I don't see you, whatever you are, our, our, uh, our date is canceled because a session comes up and I'm like, well, this is what we do. We don't have any, we don't have a plan B. I still don't, I still don't want one. I'm, I'm a little bit mis more secure in both my accomplishments and my uh, financial being than then, but still it's, uh, it's the same thing, you know, you go until it's done because somebody said this, I think Jeff Robinson said this, um, Good, good guy, MBK Entertainment manager, used to be uh, Alicia Keys manager, now has uh, some other acts, really great guy. Um, I think he said that, he said, the opportunity does not go away, it just mm -hmm. goes to somebody else. Mm. So you can never go like, well, then I'm, I'm not doing it, and so then you should have luck. No, I'm not doing it, and that person will find a different way. And so sure. try to stay in that vein of like, just make it happen. You might get fired either way, but like at least put that energy out there to put your foot forward. I mean, what, what's the what's the phrase? Ninety percent of the job is showing up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's true. I mean, it's like you said, it's relentless. The next person wants to do this as much as you do. Yep. Uh, they might not be as uh, prepared, or uh, they might not be the best choice. Maybe you are the best choice, but sure. that doesn't mean that you're definitely going to get the gig. All right. So a couple of things. First of all, can we just start over here? Oh boy. The VU meters. Yes. Are they on the master bus? Uh, they can be. They can be. They like uh, they were set up to be two for master bus and two for reference mix. Mm -hmm. um, these days, you know, I use it from time to time because uh, there's a great uh, VU meter now as a plugin called the Klanghelm. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's fantastic. You know, sound helmet. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, and it's, it's actually a, a guy in Berlin makes it, and he, he did a good job because nobody did one that was good, and his is adjustable, which is nice, so you can go from like minus nine to minus right. eighteen, etc. Uh, but he uses MJUC um, compressor. It's oh yeah, yeah, I, I heard about it. Twenty-seven. I, I not had a chance. Well, you, you know, can't beat that. Can't beat that. Um, so, so you, you don't use them as much because you're using the Clangham? Yeah, but uh, you right. know they're fun when they uh, when they jump up and down. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so then, what we got here, Avalon twenty forty four. It's a it's an opto compressor. Um, I most of the time use it for bass. It's I think. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong. I think it's a Bob Clearmountain thing. I think mm. he he kind of started using that compressor for that. And if I'm wrong, Bob, please give me a call. Uh, but it works. So if you're not doing it, then you know you should just start using it. <laughs> and actually, underneath is a 33609, which you can't see right now. Um, oh yeah, there it yeah. is. Yeah, it's a lot for pianos, uh, kind of like all kinds of plate, um, plate keyboards, like not synth, but but pianos, organ, roads, that kind of thing. I, Great. I love that. And what are you using the? Uh, the Shadow Hills on? Well, actually, these two together are one chain. Um, so the goes, black box with the Shadow Hills? Yeah, it's the Shadow Hills first, then the black box. And actually, everything goes through a little SSL, the, 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 the little mixer over there that you might see. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just like, it's not a summing mixer. I mean, you can use it as that, but I basically just insert it afterwards. Right. It's kind of, you know, have the, an idea of, a, of an SSL board as a stem that goes through an, mm -hmm. an SSL board. Does it sound exactly the same? Probably not. But it does It does have a, like a little bit of a, there's a sheen to it. It's, it's an interesting So how much sound. hybrid are you using? So this is your master bus? This is not my master bus, by it's the way. It's not your master it's bus? It's not my oh. master bus. It's very expensive. It's a very expensive not master bus. <laughs> so what is it then? No, it's, uh, this is basically all my instruments that are not drum, bass, and vocals. Wow. So, and the reason, I, I tell you exactly why. The, the, this compressor is fantastic, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but it's a very specific sound. It has a very, it's a kind of a big bottom end, but in a way, uh, I would rather go to like a, um, a the description would be more loose mm -hmm. and big than tight and big. So that works great for a rock song, actually. It works great for, it, w it would work great for like, piano string ballad, that kind of stuff. Right. But for the actual, you know, R&B or like pop drums, I think it's not a good fit. 
So what I decided, like, and it's just mostly on the bottom. So I decided, you know, what if I don't put any bottomy instruments into it? Mm -hmm. Use it only for my basically my uh, keyboard instruments and uh, sometimes strings, but mostly like everything that's guitars and keyboards mostly. And um, the black box actually kind of it's a mi little bit of a mini guitar amp, right? Like it's a it's a tube uh, t d double tube stage with a, also a parallel tube stage. Right. So it's kind of almost like a layer of saturation. So I imagine that to be as kind of a, an exciter in a way, you know, make it a little bit more crispy. It's kind of a smiley crispy. Let's put it like that. A little bit sure. on the bottom, a little bit on the top. And so, but I'm happy, happier this way than having my whole bus going through that. Um, so yeah, that's one, one hybrid part of every mix. Imagine this as a sidecar for our keyboards and guitars. I think nice, that's, that's a nice idea. expensive little... Uh... Sub I, that was not the way it planned it, but like <laughs> once you buy it, you know, once you buy it, it's not like I have. I have one really annoying disease. It's like it doesn't matter how much it costs. If I hear it and I really like it, I will pay the money. And I now that I know that I like it better, I can't justify even for the money to yeah. give it back. It's just that's a weird feeling. That's like now I know it could be better, and all I'm saving is money. That's why are we doing this, right? So yeah. even if it's only 5% better, like I use, for instance, the atomic clock, yep. I'm okay with the price because I, I think it's a little better. So we got to have it. <laughs> now the crane song here. Crane song. Um, monitor controller, very complicated. Not very good for your, uh, for your clients because they will start button pushing buttons, especially because the talk function is over here. Right. Seriously? Seriously, Crane Song? Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but, but sounds amazing. And as you can hear, all relay, uh, mm -hmm. like, like, I don't know, I think every step has a relay. So it's very, very expensive, but very accurate. And, you know, have specific settings. Like, this would be a good master settings, like where I start listening to it, 16, a little lower. But you can uh, change it so that, um, obviously, all the speakers are aligned so they are this, at the same level for that. But it can also recall the level very exact. And that helps you with getting you know better and zoning in. Sure. We were talking about that in that other course a little bit. Yeah. And uh, you can you can tell you if you've got any ear fatigue. Because if you know this is a level that you're working um, most yeah. of the time. Yeah, yeah uh, that's, that's right. You always hear the same thing. You al also get a feel of like, well, shouldn't my body hear the kick drum here mm -hmm. when it's there? And if it, I don't hear that, then, well, we're not quite there yet, right? Sure. So it's a, it's an important thing to have a physicality between between your that speakers. and looking at the VU meter. Yeah, sort of. it's uh it's uh, it's nice. Well, while we're sort of in this vicinity, you've yeah. got three different pairs of speakers here. Yeah, so we have the uh, Focal Twin Six Bs, which uh, if you have the Focals, you know what they sound like. When mine sound different, because mine are uh, mine have the Cal uh, Cal Tats Phantom Focus System which means uh, there's two subwoofers to it and then actually also an EQ. So they're tuned f to my room. They're bolted into the floor so they can't move. Because it's very, oh, wow. Yeah, it's very important that they, they're basically in 3D space in this room. They're in the exact correct position where they perform optimal, optimally. Wow. Uh, so they don't sound like Focals anymore. Imagine them just, the Focal is the hardware. What I did is the implementation. Um, beautiful speakers, though. Um, actually, I first uh, Prince had those on uh, on, a, on a B room, and I was like, "Oh, these are interesting." So we Great. started doing that. Proax, everybody loves Proax. I think. I think I. This is it's my second pair. I still have another one, but I started using it 18 years ago. Always schlepping them around. Great. Um, it's a great, great speaker. What are those powered, or are you driving them? Uh, for uh, Bryson 4B ST. Bryson? I think, yeah. I actually don't use products. I, I, I do know people who use them, so I don't, no, I'm not a hu hugely knowledgeable. I tell you exactly. What, the, the thing I like most about it is vocal levels are perfect. Mm -hmm. Like, where you could set it, that's, that's where it is. Where, for instance, NS10s, vocal levels are, you have to learn them. They're always a little louder than they actually are. Mm -hmm. And you, you, can, you can totally, you obviously, people know what their speakers sound like. But it is not exactly what's there. And on the ProRack, I think that, especially that, the vocal level is. Well, we right always used to say Venice tends that they have to be offensive. If like the guitars are like oh, and the snare drums oh, like okay, it's good. To me, to me, NS tens are make you make a calculation in your head. Like mm -hmm. if it's so, then it is so. And I'd rather have a speaker that is if it's so, then it's 
exactly. what I hear. Exactly. You know, so <laughs> th this com connection of speakers, uh, th this collection of uh, speakers actually does that for me because these small ones, Pilonus 42s, they have like these tenor concentric uh, I was about to say, drivers. Like tenor dual concentrics. Yeah. It's an active speaker that can actually be uh, tuned with a USB connection. Mm. Um, but basically, when you go from the small one to the middle one to the big one, they just expand in in, um, in frequency range, and they don't. It's not like every single speaker sounds totally different. So, three different um, three different looks at the same thing. And then actually, there's uh, bigs in here too. I have uh, two KV audio satellites and two um, 18 inch uh, back end subs. And they're sitting, they're, hiding? They're behind the screen. Uh, sorry, I mean... By side uh, of the screen. There, and then the, the, the subs are behind the screen. So this, are you using this? Yes. Yes, at all times. I mean... Writing automation, do you find it easier to work on fader? Yes, I... Uh, I don't endorse many things, but I actually endorse this thing. That doesn't mean that Avid gave it to me. Come on, Avid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I bought it, uh, but there's a video on the Avid website of me show, showing you why it is so great. But uh, I think personally, it's their best effort between. I mean, obviously right. between price and uh, and. What's the actual model? Oh, it's a C24. 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 Right. And uh, you see it. I, 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 at one point, I had one of these roll around carts over here, mm -hmm. and but I found myself doing this a lot. So sure. I was like, let's do this instead. So what I did, and I know this looks a little funny, but my keyboard is propped up so that these, these faders can actually go underneath the keyboard. And that's why it all these, this uh, is what, what your video comments will a uh, ask. Why did Richard take off all the <laughs> caps from the fader? Right. Because they always ask that because then it fits under the keyboard. So there. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, I mean, if you if you watch the course that we that we did, yep. I do a lot of stuff in trim read mode, which means all my faders are at zero anyway. Sure. And how much am I going to change the sound? Three dB, five dB, maybe. That's still in the travel of the fader that I can access from here. It's mm -hmm. not going to be twenty dB down. Um, so uh, I I highly recommend it. You can you can go literally into um, into into the, the plugins here. There yeah, can tweak my my mix from here, and it's it's really beautiful and fast. And once you program it correctly, that every plugin comes up with the same layout, twenty four buttons. So the high end is always in the same place. It becomes very intuitive. I like it. It doesn't mean that I do every single thing on it. But it's nice to have that here. I have my VCA faders here. Um, let's see. Leads, there, guitars, keyboards, drums, etc. Yeah. 24 VCA faders, 24 master faders, and then obviously you can just step through the whole session. So once you have it programmed to your template, it's a really a, a real time saver. If you just have it, if you walk into a studio and you just open your Pro Tools session and you haven't uh, made no effort to match it somehow with your workflow, sure. it's kind of in the way. You, you have to I understand. You have to learn it for yourself. But it's great. It actually has a full surround monitor section with uh, that's fully featured. It's amazing. Now you've got a nice collection of outboard here. Yeah. Um, what do you so what what's the, what are you using for mixing and what are you using for tracking? Was it all mixing? In this rack everything is for mixing except for the sans amp and the chandler. Uh, these guys. Those two there. Yeah, they, I mean, they could be, but I don't happen to use them that much. As you can see, between all of my outboard, it's mostly compressors. I believe that uh, A, I think EQs are totally fine in the computer, and B, EQs are the things that we change most. So it would be silly at this point to go back to a fully recallable scenario with EQs. That's just not my workflow anymore. Sure. Uh, Although compressors are shaping the sound as well, sonically, they're adding characteristics. You, are you finding you're using specific, like here, for instance, the VAC rack mm -hmm. is very popular. If CLA has racks of these things. Yeah. What are, you, what are you using that for? Well, actually, the funny part is, so when you're talking about CLA, as far as I know, he uses them for stems of uh, background vocals a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I tried that, actually. You know, we all read, right? Yeah. I, it's not for me. Yeah. Um, most of the time, because in, in pop and R&B, we have so many layered stems mm -hmm. of backgrounds that I would actually, like him, have to have like 10 of them in order sure. for it to not 
wave or compression against compression when overlapping parts ha are yeah. happening. So actually, what's <coughs> happening here is more like, it's a little bit of a uh, Michael Brower kind of situation where I use this one, the tube tech, and the uh, vac rack, and the 1176, and one more unit, the stay level, which Phil Scholl, uh, Phil, what was his last name now? Shout out to Phil at <laughs> Retro is yep. actually refurbishing right now. It's, it should be in the ma mail. Yep. But these are all parallel compressor for the lead vocal only. Okay, so tell us a little bit about the hardware chain you're using on this vocal here. Yeah, yeah. So um, normally what happens is I get a vocal. It might be recorded like I recorded, like with a little compression, with a little EQ. Just, you know, do your job, make a good recording. Or it might be very raw, like we didn't touch it at all, or the microphone was not good, or what have you. So I actually have kind of three steps to it. Like one is, take the original vocal track. I am basically re-engineering the vocal in a way where I said, well, if I had recorded this, I would have done this. Which, in the first case, uh, in the first place is always, you know, clean it up a little bit, get, you know, the low uh, cut in there, everything that's on a vocal, like, you know, on a male, definitely under 80, in a, in a, um, on a female vocal, depending on the range, it could be up to like 140 or so. I mean, sure. you know, 100, 140, just clean it up. You don't need any of that part anyway. And then compress it a little bit where you say, well, if I had been there, I would have compressed it there anyway, just for the level. Sure. Not so much for the sound, because we're going to get that into the next step. But basically, I, I, I create something that would be a cool multi-track for me. If I wanted to, I could print it. I know your friend Mark Endert, he does things like that, and then he sure. just prints it. Yeah. But I'm like, my computer is so powerful. Why? It's an extra step. Just leave it. You know. Sure. And then plus, sometimes you know your client disagrees, so you go back. <laughs> right. But I do, I do like the CLA three A. Um, I'm, I'm not a guy who sits here and says that's the best CLA three. Uh, the best LA three A because obviously UAD makes one too, and every like for instance, Mac DSP makes models that sure. are supposed to be that. That doesn't matter. To me, this CLA 3A just this one thing that keeps keeps the vocal in your face, doesn't sound too compressed like an 1176 mm -hmm. would be. Uh, I personally am, a, again, I'm a Bob Clear Mountain fan. He's a C, uh, an LA 3A fan. That's probably where it came from. But this this sure. thing works, you know? Yep. Um, and I, I and it's it. really easy to use. Two big knobs that you turn. That's exactly. It. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Gotta love that. To me, uh, um, compression, as long as it goes back to zero in be in between the phrase somewhere, so I'm not totally pummeling something that I don't need to be pummeling. Mm -hmm. We're okay with that. So this this might be between five and, in this case, ten. I must admit, that's a little bit more than I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> but, you didn't check it before you opened the session. I what didn't check say? it, but <laughs> you know, this is real. This is real. This stuff. is real life. It felt good to me at the time, apparently. So that's what right. we did. Anyway, so um, if I uh, sometimes I get a kick out of committing plugins because you see a waveform, <laughs> yep. what happens to it, and I am a very, I'm very pleased when it looks pretty straight without sounding totally squashed. Right. You know, um, <laughs> uh, you should all do that. You should all print waveforms because that matters. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to look at you. No, 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 no. I you know. do not need to be. You looking. do not need to. Do it. But no like, looking, listening. But I do get satisfaction from it anyway. <laughs> I understand. Um, so from there, so so assuming that this made no particularly a great change in the uh, in the spectrum EQ, etc., I now hit um, four, actually five parallel compressor, uh, five parallel channels, and show them to you right here. Bam. Okay. This, uh, they, these five over here, and uh, why is it there five? Well, one has nothing on it, so I can know what, what it would sound like if I didn't have anything. The next four are a stay level, uh, an 1176, uh, a tube tech compressor over there, and a vac rack. Uh, in this particular case, apparently I didn't use one of them. But imagine these guys here these, these uh, faders, as organ bars, uh, draw bars on an organ with specific sounds that you want to feature. And in my case, I, I describe it often. I think the tube tech gives it like a suit satiny kind of feel. Um, it, I only use it for like a dB or two. It actually almost doesn't matter how much compression is on there because I'm using it for the feel of the box instead of how hard I want to go with sure. the compression. The, uh, 
Uh, the rack rack, I feel, is very, very straight ahead, very unintrusive compression that doesn't change the sound mm -hmm. much. So it's basically straightforward, but a little bit more compressed. Mm -hmm. I hit it like 7, 8 dB, and you almost can't hear it. I mean, the compression action of it. But there's, a ni there's nice tubes in there, so it's a right. nice... Uh, nice uh, a nice sound to, to help me with it. And then the 1176 sounds like you would expect, like a fat, fast compression, kind of a little little raunchy yeah. in, a, in a way, yeah. especially next to these other two. Sure. Um, in the state level, the funny part of the thing is um, the state level is also known to be a very good vocal compressor, but it's actually a very, very, very thick compressor. Mm -hmm. right? Like the way you get like a lot of low end and uh, warm, like for better, uh, lack of a better word, warmth and maybe mud in the wrong places uh, on it. And even if you hit it 20 dB, it still sounds pretty good. Now, somebody could say, well, I want to buy the tube tag or I want to buy the stay level. And I'm like, I think you're wrong. You have to have both because they're so different from each other that if you have a thin vocal with a tube tag, you're going to lose. If you have yep. a thick vocal with a stay level, you're going to lose. It's, it's, like, it's like gloves. That have to fit the source. If you have a thin vocal and you need some thickness, feature more of the stay level. If, if you have a thick vocal. So you have all three of these working at the moment? Yep. The stay level is out being repaired. It's being repaired. It's coming back this week, actually. <clears throat> so can we press play on it? Absolutely. So you can see, all, you can see the tube tech working here, the back rack, and then down here, the blue stripe 1176. And then he's blending all three back. Yeah, and you see that I'm not using the same amount of compression. It's just, it's kind of I'm using the same amount of, com the, the amount of compression that I believe is, is a good fit for that compressor. Right. That, that's, that gives me the, um, the tonality that I'm looking for it. And right now, in this particular vocal, I'm using most of the tube tech. You can see that here. And just use the other ones a little bit, bit separately. They are level to each other. So if I just put them all at zero, I can actually shoot them out pretty nicely. But then I choose how much to use of each. It's a, it's a parallel compression thing um, that I have to give some credit to for Michael Brower because he does th similar things. The point here is not to buy the compressors that I have. The point is to use four or five different processors that um, that are separate from each other, that have um, um, that have different tonalities. If they all sound the same, there's no point to it. And if they, if you can't really decide what they like, if you can't describe what they sound like for your own senses, then you're kind of guessing. So that's not the point. Don't just just find a com uh, these combination of compressors work for me because I can describe what each tool is, what color it is. But it doesn't right. mean it has to be these. There could be a distressor. There could be an LA-2A there. Just a couple of different options that help you uh, find a tonality for the, for the uh, vocal in this case. You know? um, but yeah, a little pile Wonderful. thing. So I have a, I have a couple of questions. So yes. you've got that. So those are all being bussed together. That's what I was looking at. Right. They're coming from here yeah. into all these five. Yeah. And I'm just using the ones I'm using. Out of the five, I'm using only three. Yeah. Uh, and then they go into this channel. So this Ignore channel. Ignore these two other channels. They're just copies in case of more vocals. So you've got a bit of high high lift there. Yeah. You've got some de-essing. Uh, yeah. This is kind of like the uh, dynamic EQ of uh, of about three K. This is um, just getting rid of some of that, like ah. yeah, it, yeah. I could do that with the C4 that I'm using later too, but at this vocal, I somehow decided I needed a little bit beforehand. Channel strip. Channel strip is on every track that I ever do. I think it's the uh, it's a great, great EQ. It's a it's a touchy compressor. Like you have, I think uh, it's good to have presets for yourself because if you just engage it, it might run away from you. But um, it's a, it's a great EQ. Very very clean. Um, a, a good purpose EQ, you know. I don't want to. Uh, I'm not looking for anything specific because actually the tonality comes mostly from these compressors, even though I kind of use them as an EQ, you know. And then finally, we have a little bit of that. We can play a little bit of that. I just want to be so it's just kind of like a, a dynamic EQ gives me a little bit more of. Uh, 
a little bit more of the uh, the presence and obviously I was looking for a little bit less woof uh, and and warmth under underneath but um I'm trying here to keep that kind of very very subtle like in the range of like a db or two because that's how much I would EQ it anyway I would not notch out 6 db out of the bottom of a vocal most likely um, and then as a, in this particular case during the mix I decided well uh, I probably need a little bit more presence which I could have done with any EQ but really the output of a band of a, of a dynamic um, of a multiband compressor is basically an EQ, you know. So right. I just decided that I could have done it here, then it would have pushed a little bit more into the dynamic compression. But at that time, it's kind of it's it's a little balancing act. The whole point is we the whole point of the whole chain is to keep the vocal kind of like a cork, mm -hmm. uh, hovering on top of the arrangement, right? So that cannot be a static pro process because the arrangement changes and gets thin and thick and whatever. So to have the dynamic um, compression or, and equalization helping push that against each other a little bit, it's just, um, it's just something that has to be balanced while you're mixing. So you, can't, you, you probably won't come up with these settings while soloing. It's not going to happen. The, your EQ might come, uh, sure. you, you're going to get a good EQ with that, but then you're going to see, okay, this syllable is missing, that syllable is missing, where is, this, where is this pushing up and down? Oh, now, like, everything seems good dynamically, but maybe now it's too uh, skinny because you, you over-engineered it a little bit, you know? Sure. So, like, there's a thing that, that happens. It takes the most time, I think, on a mix because... Uh, there's a lot of instruments unless they have to have uh, surgery because they were recorded really, really badly. Most of them don't have to be mangled. Sure, I agree. Uh, vocals have to be mangled because they, uh, next to... Mangled, I like that. We're yeah, they have to be mangled because next to, I think probably, um, next to, let's say, uh, electric basses, they are probably the most, um, uh, most dynamic things that we actually record. It's interesting. I, I, I've been saying that for years. I think probably because I heard it from smarter people than me. I think Dave Jordan said to me like 20 years ago that uh, the two most difficult things for him to mix were bass guitars and vocals. Yeah. And he actually said that he uses the same set of compression on a bass guitar that he uses on vocal and vice versa. Yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm not even saying it's hard. It's just by the nature of the beast, it takes more attention. Like, uh, you know, you have, uh, uh, sorry, and acoustic... Hard is probably my word. He no, probably... no, that's, that's yeah. fine. But the um, <laughs> acoustic pianos, yeah. th those two. But like, not roads, not organs, sure. not definitely not electric guitars. They don't move much, you know. Um, so in drums, we kind of already know where they want to end up with. So a static process on, even, if, even though dynamics like uh, compression on drums normally doesn't change from the top to the end of the tune. But actually, with a vocal, we're constantly writing, we're constantly pushing these little details up and down to make it sound like we were never there. Sure. You know. Um, Marvelous. But, but that's, the, that's the idea. Um, now, you, now, maybe one, more, more, one sure. more thing about that. You don't even need to use hardware either. You could also use Ford. I was about to say, you, the, the, the stuff we did in the course and that you've been moving towards mm -hmm. is doing stuff in the box. Yeah. For recallability? No, um, at this point, I'm in an interesting position. Obviously, I already have this stuff. Sure. I think this is, uh, this is maybe also uh, Chris Lord Alvey's uh, uh, point. Like, sure, maybe he could go in the box, but why? He has all the stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, what's, what's the point, right? I could sell all this, and then my studio would look really, really empty. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't like that. So I don't have to go in the box, right? But you're challenging yourself. I'm challenging myself. I'm always trying to find new, uh, new sounds. Mm -hmm. I, I want to say that all of these compressors never change their settings. Uh, I only drive them harder or less hard. So the recalability is actually not an issue for me. Right. Um, there's a couple of shortcomings with the hardware, which is if I have a duet, well, now what? Right, you have to be uh, more careful. Or if I have a lot of overlapping lines, then compressors don't like when they're being fed two different signals at the same sure. time. Things, so it's basically it, it becomes a logistic problem uh, unless I would buy everything again. So I actually have to know how to do it without it. <laughs> you know. I see. So so both of these are important, but it doesn't. I don't want to replace it. I want to. 
I want to tickle, tickle my senses for new things, you know. And actually, there's nothing that says an, um, an awesome, uh, awesome um, digital compressor couldn't sound better than than an analog one for specific things. It doesn't right. always. Analog hardware has specific limitations, and digital software has specific limitations. And sometimes they help you, sometimes they don't. Auto align for drums, you couldn't do that uh, with an analog uh, piece. The same like a Surfer EQ, which happens to be the same company. <laughs> like there's a, a, or even you know something more straightforward, trigger. Right. Like sometimes the computer is just a better choice. Right. And uh, and I, I like that. I have 40 or 50, probably more, <laughs> compressor plugins in the computer. I might as well use them. Uh, it would be silly to think that they were all bad, you know. And I w it would yeah. also be silly to think that all of this is better than them. Oh, I so it's yeah. it's part it's part of how we make records in the 2000s. The workflow. What do you like? Do you like leaning over and twisting a knob, or do you like clicking on a button? Sometimes yeah. it's is an enjoyment to it as well. I, li I like the twisting the knob, which is why I have these guys, right. you know. Um, but there, there's something just said to be for both, and um, I think everybody should look at it like that. You know, just you know for a fact at this point that thirty to sixty percent. I'm making this the statistic up of all <laughs> records are made completely in the box, and they hit records. Right. You, I would I would almost bet that every EDM record you hear is completely in the box. I could be wrong, but most, uh, I, I don't think I am, but yeah. I could be. Um, so why not you? Why not Why not the, the, the tools that you bought inst uh, instead of like a rack of things that I happen to collect over 18 years? I didn't go out yesterday and buy them all. Right. Maybe I wouldn't if I came here at this junction today. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. This was great times. Good, thanks for, uh, Thanks for showing us around. Thanks for the little print stories. That was quite fun. Oh, yeah. You know, get a, get a go there when you can. Marvelous. Well, um, those of you that have been following along will know that we just did a course with you. Yep. So please click some links probably up here and down there and around here. We'll and put them in stuff. all corners. In all the corners. And uh, check out the course. It's pretty fantastic. Um, I know Eric and Sam, who've been working on the course and the edits and stuff, are very excited about it because you go into some insanely good detail. Oh, thank you. Like, uh, yeah, you, we try. You make it up as you go, but you, you know, show them what what's really important. And I think we're going all the way through from the prep, through the start, through the finish. Uh, I think we're doing a master comparison, right? Yeah, it is. And you you watch so many of these courses yourself. I do. So you learn from other courses, and I think what was great about it is you were able to like take all the shortcomings of other people's courses and make sure that yours didn't have them. Oh, <laughs> well, that's that's cool. I hope that's true. I'm always interested, like al like we always say, uh, always a student forever. And uh, there's there's ten thousand ways of doing these, and uh, the people on your side have their ways, and I appreciate them. So every everybody has their little tidbit. So for that matter, you should probably check out all of them. Marvelous. Yeah. Thank you ever so much. You got it. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below, and we'll speak to you all again very soon. That sounds good.